Hello and welcome to Mulch, with me your host Rebecca Anning Brown. This is a weekly podcast for flower farmers who want to build a confident flower farming practice that reflects the lifestyle that you want now and in the future. Each week I'll share conversation and tips to nurture and grow you and your flower farm. I'll open conversations that flower farmers find difficult to talk about, provide approaches that will help you to make decisions, chuckle at the idiosyncrasies of our work, and always be real and honest about my own work as a flower farmer. My goal is to help you to grow a curious, confident and grounded flower farming practice that flourishes as a business that you love and are proud to shout about. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and if you like what you hear please do leave a review and share the podcast with your flower farming friends. It really does help to grow a confident and successful flower farming community. Hello and welcome to another episode of Mulch. Welcome back. It's growing week nine. Can you believe it? Like it's almost like a fifth of the way through the year already. I'm sorry if that scares some of you, but it's incredibly exciting. Time is flying. The days are getting longer and longer. Seed sowing is in peak flow. Things are starting to grow. It is a wonderful time of the year. So I think we have a corker of a show today. It's a topic that's close to my heart. It's a topic that I know comes into play for lots of flower farmers early on in their flower farming worlds. And so I really hope that it is helpful to lay things out on the table to share a little of my experience and the conversations I've had with other flower farmers and just have an open conversation. I said that's what we were going to do here on Mulch and I think that's what we're doing. Before I do that, there are a couple of things that I would just like to share. Firstly, the most enormous and grateful thank you to you all for listening. I thank you thank you thank you thank you if you are enjoying the podcast and you're listening week in week out i would be so grateful if you would rate the podcast and if you would drop a review the reason that this is important is because that's how apple and spotify or audible or whichever provider you're using decide how many other flower farmers they feel should listen to the to the show and our mission is to help as many flower farmers get on and grow as possible and to do that by talking about the reality of flower farming the business aspects of it and by sharing our tips and advice that we've learned over the past four years some of which we've learned the hard way we really really want to make it easier for others so I'd be super grateful if you'd be able to do that thank you the second thing that I want to share with you today is our next workshop for flower farmers it's available to book now it's called seeds of change and it's a workshop for those of you who are considering a transition from one career to flower farming or who are in the process of making that change. As ever, our workshop is based on our experience and we'll talk through all of the things that possibly we will take for granted in a few years, but right now they're still really close to our business history and our hearts. So what does that mean? What will we cover in the workshop? Well, I will talk a little about lifestyle and help you to identify the reasons why you are transitioning or considering a change. But moreover, I will talk about and help you to think through things like money and preparation for self-employment, the reality of required investment in a business like flower farming, family, friends, commitments, children, what it means to make that decision, 
the other job and ways to balance the work. We'll also talk about making sure that you're doing both jobs well. And in so doing, we will absolutely make sure that we think about preventing burnout, well-being, self-care. Um, I think one of the elements that is consistent within all of our workshops is the element of deciding or working out how much you want something and also that reflection and thoughts towards what happens if plan A doesn't work. Our approach is very much snail rather than hair. So we'll talk to you about the decisions that we've made, the order that we've made them in, and also the speed that we've made some decisions at. And I think it will surprise you, despite where we've got to after four seasons, how steadily we've made those decisions and how we've allowed time to influence things as much as proactive decision making and we'll talk about creating a useful support network and training in cpd those things that are part of all the jobs that you'll have done historically and are just as relevant to a career as a flower farmer so Anthony and I have put this workshop together because the decision to build a flower farm for us, like many of you, started as a passion project and it very quickly became a side hustle and we very much so felt our way through the past four seasons, five years. We've had incredible advice and some terrible words of wisdom too. But in honesty, we have often felt like we are receiving brilliant advice from people who are three or four steps ahead of us in their flower farming world, which has been really, really helpful to give us that sight for the future. But it's also meant that there has been a void, a gap, um, like an unanswered space that was so far removed from our advisors that they had almost forgotten them, that that kind of space. I think for that reason, it has often felt pretty lonely making decisions for our future and our children's future, I guess in part because we are both fortunate to have secure jobs because it really is an atypical career path or career choice for us to make, or at least from the outside, that's how it appears. And because those around us, to varying degrees at varying times, have been full of disbelief. I mean, it, it really is quite a stupid thing to do if you think about it on paper. But life's of taking chances and life is for enjoyment and life only comes to us once and Anthony and I have learned that the hard way. Life really does only come once and so we've decided that continuing on our journey, and I do hate that word, but continuing on our journey uh, to flower farmer grace, um, we it's the right thing to do for us. So if any of this sounds like you, join us. Join us on March the 17th, Sunday, March the 17th, for this workshop, Seeds of Change. The workshop will be recorded and you will be sent a copy. It will not be available for sale or download after the event. So it's for March the 17th. Those in attendance on March the 17th will receive a copy or if you've paid for your tickets you'll receive a copy but we won't be offering it up for future downloads what we have found what i have found over the past couple of months with our first four workshops is that 
the real value comes from the opportunity for you to ask questions and for me to respond honestly and openly. The topics that I present, the way that I present them is designed to stimulate you to think, to reflect, to ask questions and to really explore whatever subject matter we're discussing. And so to make that possible and useful to everyone present, we have decided to limit the places on this workshop to 10 so that there's enough time and space for everyone. To book your place, follow the link in the show notes below or head directly to our website, which is www.silvergreatfoliage.com and you'll find the Seeds of Change workshop under the Flower Farming tab. Okay, so today we are talking about fear and the flower farmer. And when I say fear, I don't mean all those things that we worry about as flower farmers, like mice, foals, rain, weather, wind, um, polytunnels, deer, snow, a late first frost. I mean, the list is actually quite long. These are all things that we worry about, but they're not things that we're afraid of, so to speak. So what do I mean? I mean the things that we're actually scared of. So I'm going to call those out and say that that is not having flowers, not being able to grow flowers, no one wanting to buy your flowers, fear that your flower farm dream is one that everyone else is laughing at, and fear of failure. So I'm not a psychologist. But I have certainly felt all of these over the past four seasons and five years. And I'm pretty certain that I'll feel them again to varying degrees in the course of this season, which will be our fifth season and sixth year flower farming. And in reality, even though we cut 80,000 stems last year, I still look at our growing site at the moment and just wonder, will I actually have flowers again this year? Which is crazy, because I know that the answer is yes, but that is what I'm afraid of. Will I have flowers? So often this is referred to by flower farmers as imposter syndrome, which is when people doubt their skills, talents, or accomplishments, and have a persistent internalised fear of being exposed as frauds. Now I'm going to come back to you that exposure as a fraud thing in a separate episode, but let's just carry on for the moment, um, because I think there's an interesting side note here. So the term imposter syndrome or phenomenon was introduced in an article published in 1978. It was entitled The Imposter Phenomenon in High Achieving Women, Dynamics and Therapeutic Intervention. In this, the authors defined imposter syndrome as an internal experience of intellectual phoniness. So, for completeness, these references are from Wikipedia, and yes, I do know that it's not a full review of the available research. However, I I think that's enough in terms of background and definitions for the purposes of this podcast. And I'm just going to repeat that definition, an internal experience of intellectual phoniness. Is that really what we're fearing as a flower farmer? Because whilst imposter syndrome is definitely a thing, it's more than a thing, it's paralysing and horrible. Um, it's, and it's something that in its truest sense, I have definitely experienced and continue to experience in honesty in my other roles. But I'm not sure, I'm just not certain that this is what newer flower farmers are actually scared of. So again, um, I have a few caveats. First is I am not a psychologist. I'm not a psychotherapist. And the second is that this podcast is my view rather than a piece of research. And please take it in those terms. Because this is our podcast, I'm going to refer to myself as a case study here. And in doing so, I will use some of my own thoughts and also parts of conversations that I've had with other flower farmers over the years. Because the way that 
I see it, Flower Farmer fear is more related to two possible outcomes when you try your hardest to make your dream work. The first of those fears is, what if I fail? And the second is, what if I succeed? Okay, let's start with the second option. I mean, seriously, what if I succeed? I grow flowers, people buy them. I grow more flowers, people buy those too. What does this mean? What do I do next? Will I have to grow more flowers? Will I be able to keep up with demand? Will I need a bigger space to grow? Does that mean that I should spend more time doing this? Um, I mean, how do I describe myself? I'm growing the flowers, people are buying them. Am I now a commercial grower? I mean, whoa, stop with the questions. No matter what school of thought you come from or what goals you have in your flower farming world, part of the concept of success as a flower farmer is growing flowers and receiving money in return for them consistently. But can you see how all of these questions take away the fun and the joy from what you've achieved? The questions are totally relevant, but do you really have to answer them all now? Do you really have to tell anyone other than the closest confidence in your world what you're thinking and how it's going? Do you really need to change anything or make any decisions when things are going well right now? So this um, example, the fear of success, brought to mind two stories for me. The first is from my clinical world. So I am old enough to remember the days when mobile phones were rare and not everybody had one or for that matter two in their back pocket and so when I would see patients and their relatives they would wait until they had enough information before they contacted more relatives and friends um, about what was going to happen next Flash forward to 2022, 23, the modern world, and it probably actually started around kind of 2014, 15, and I noticed a real change. Everybody had a mobile phone by then, and so every word, every blood test, every beep of the machine was reported to friends and family. Everything. And... I would ask families at some points how I could help and they would say remove the stress or make us worry less and I would explain that I I can't change what's happening any quicker um, than medicine allows and I can't give a clear expectation of the outcomes just yet and I would also say that possibly the thing that was increasing anxiety was that need to report every three seconds. Maybe just you put the phone away, sit on it, and share information once you know more. Because the more you share information, the more questions it invites from everybody you're sharing it with. So take the pressure off yourself by just holding holding on to your goat, holding on to the information for a little bit longer and sitting with it until we know more. The second thing um, I was reminded of was when I was little. So do you remember playing shops when you were little? I do. Um, I used to love playing shops. I remember that if somebody asked me for beans, but all they had was peas... I would just say, sorry, no beans, have some peas. Or if I used all of my change, I would say, sorry, I don't have any change in the till, you'll need to spend more money. Or if I had sold all the bread, I would say with absolute delight to my pretend customer, sorry, all gone, come back tomorrow and close the door and pull down the imaginary blinds. I mean, as far as I was concerned, having sold all the bread was a good thing. Like My game was complete and it was a success. Now, 
obviously, when you're running a flower farm, you are using real money and earning real money. But my point is that it's possible that as adults, we forget to enjoy the experience because of all the questions that we ask. Is, is it possible that we forget to have fun and just play the game even harder because we ask questions and we don't have the answers immediately? I guess what I'm saying is that in many ways it appears to me that the reason that we fear success as a flower farmer is because it's it's often something that starts as something that's fun, something that's enjoyable, something that's engaging, and success takes us by surprise and makes us worry and question and fear what happens next. What happens next is not in our control. I'm going to repeat that. What happens next is not in our control. What is in our control is how hard we play the game and how much fun we have playing the game. Perhaps we should just keep playing the game and enjoy having fun and play harder and see where that takes us for a while before we ask the questions. Because success is a good thing. Isn't it? So when Anthony and I were in the field um, adding to the rabbit defences the other day, I asked him a question. I asked him what he thought the day I came home and said, I found a flower farm, I found a farmer, and he said we can grow on his fields. I found a flower farm. And he said, do you really want to know? And of course I replied, yes, I wanted to know. He said, I thought you were stark, raving mad, Rebecca. I laughed. I mean, uh, many people think I'm stark, raving mad. But the key thing is that even though he thought that, that's not what he said. My dear husband took a deep breath, probably sighed and went, brilliant. Now what do we do? Perhaps... What you actually expected me to say when I was talking about fear of flower farming or fear and the flower farmer was option one, the fear of failure. I mean, frankly, I didn't know that people actually were already making perfectly reasonable livings out of growing and selling flowers when we started. And so I was inclined to believe my friends of a family who told me that I was being ridiculous and that I should keep my hobby as exactly that. And moreover, I didn't believe that something so fun could be called work. And so even though fear of failure seemed in reality to be more like a reasonable expectation that the flower farm was unlikely to succeed... That's not what I was afraid of. I was afraid that sharing joy and beauty through my work on the land wouldn't be real. And that fear about my dream not being real was the biggest definition of failure. And it was crippling. Because as an adult, we have... To be realistic, we have to be constructive, decisive, practical, pragmatic. We have to think about the future and we have to think about the impact on our current lifestyle and also the lives of those who rely on us. And in our case, we have children. Some of you may need to keep a roof over the heads of your parents or you may have the legacy of a family farm that you are entrusted with and so as an adult it often feels like we're not allowed to dream are we you see when you stop working on a dream something that is close to your heart and precious when you care so much about making it happen that making it happen means a sort of happiness that is difficult to describe put into words and it's about more than money failure isn't 
failure isn't just the wasted money and time. It's more than people laughing and saying, I told you so. And even when you know that most ideas take more than one attempt and that when things go wrong, it's an opportunity to learn. When you care and it's not just a project for a client, it hurts. It really hurts. So whether you're afraid of success on your platform or you fear that your dream won't come to fruition, the impact is often the same. It's paralysing. It's so paralysing that you get less done. It takes longer to get things off the ground. And sometimes people give up. Okay, so it's not in my nature to open a can of worms and to leave you there high and dry because the purpose of mulch, the purpose of the podcast, the purpose of our one-to-one work with flower farmers is to open so that we can repackage and close, which allows us to move on and to move forward. So... Here are my top tips to help with that fear, whether it's fear of success, fear of failure, fear fear of whatever it is for you. Here are my tops to help you to reduce or remove that fear so that you can get on and grow on your flower farm. Number one, make a plan. Now, Yes, we do have a business planning for flower farmers workshop. It's still available to download until the end of the month, but I'm not necessarily, and and that doesn't allow you to make a 20 page um, detailed business proposal. That's not how we roll here at Silver Grey Foliage. But if you're worried that making a plan, making a business plan means that you have to write 20 pages of detailed business proposal, that's not what I mean. Your plan can be as simple as, this year I want to grow enough flowers to have five bunches at the garden gate once a week. If this works, next year I'd like to sell eight or ten bunches weekly. That is enough of a plan. It gives you somewhere to head, something to hold on to, something to work towards. Tip number two. Remember that the reality is that the path that you're following is it's unlikely to be straight. So learning, failing, practicing, struggling, starting again, getting it right are all part of a normal route. And I say that again, a normal route to an end goal. So try to accept all of these and not let the hard ones disillusion you. Tip number three is to acknowledge from the start that things will go wrong on your flower farm. Unless you have a perfectly planned system with uh, an impenetrable, perfect process in place, things will go wrong. And that's okay, because when things go wrong, you can learn from them, you can flex, you can adapt, you can change, and you can improve so that your flower farming work, your process, um, is better and you get better flowers. That's okay. Things will go wrong. This is normal. And you can change, learn and improve and grow better flowers as a result of it. Tip number four is to break your goals down into smaller chunks. So that end goal that we described earlier of having five bunches at the end of the drive every week is, you know, quite a big leap from the beginning of the season where we just have bags of seed sowing compost and some seeds. So break your goals down into smaller chunks so that you can see the complexity of the work that you're doing and so that you can take it step by step and understand the easier bits, the harder bits and where you need to apply more time. 
breaking it down makes it easier to see and also easier to identify your progress and see how fast you're moving towards that end goal. Tip number five is celebrate every small victory. Um, I literally did a celebratory dance um, when I finally germinated Bronzeby Plurum. Not only did I do a celebratory dance, but I shared that celebratory dance with Anthony and the children. Now, Anthony was a bit more excited than the children, but I'm not really sure he was that excited. I was over the moon. Every time you sell a bunch, celebrate that win. Celebrate the small stuff. It helps to grow your confidence. It helps you to stay in the here and now and to focus on what's going well now and what you're doing now rather than what's next or in the future. Just remembering Anthony's favourite phrase to me, which is that I can only control what's going on now. I, I have no control over what's going on in the future. Which brings me rather neatly on to tip number six, which is to stay focused on the things that are in your control. It takes time for the ladybird population to build up so that they will eat all the green flies on your roses. You can't speed this up effectively. So be patient and let the ecosystem do its thing. In the meantime, do the things that you can do well, like water the roses, feed the roses, focus on the things that you can do. You can sow your seeds in accordance with your schedule. You can get stuff planted out on time. You can water them in well. You can continue to water if there's a drought, but you can't control when the next rainfall will come from the sky. And finally, most importantly, stay in your own lane and have fun. This doesn't mean stop having hopes and dreams. This also doesn't mean keep your dreams small. Make your big, make your big dreams, make, make your dreams big and creative and as crazy as you like, but make sure that they are your dreams. They're your flower farm dreams that you're aiming for, not someone else's. Okay, so look, fear isn't a bad thing. Like fear in its box, so kept in perspective, gives you a healthy respect for what you love and what you're trying to achieve. So the aim of today's podcast is not to say, here are your fears, let's magnify them. It's to acknowledge those fears, to put a finger on what it is that you're scared of, and to start to help you to work with them rather than against them so that you can enjoy what you're doing and get on and grow. That's it for today. I hope that this episode is helpful. If you've enjoyed the episode, do remember to leave a rating and review now whilst it's still fresh in your mind. Please do keep sharing the podcast in your stories on Instagram and on Facebook. Book your place, if you'd like one, um, on the Seeds of Change workshop. It's on March the 17th. It's a Sunday. It will start at 9.30 in the morning and I can't wait to see you there. And have loads of fun as we steam through week nine of the growing calendar. I'll be back next Monday with another episode of Mulch. Until then, have a fabulous week. Rebecca. Thank you for listening to Mulch. I hope that you found it useful. To find the show notes, head back to our website where you'll find links to all the things that I've been talking about in today's episode. If you're on Instagram, you can find us at Silver Grey Foliage. I would appreciate it so much if you were able to share this episode in your Instagram stories. And if you are able to leave a review, it really will help more people to get on and grow. I'll be back with you next Monday to talk about more flower farming in practice. Rebecca.